Hi, everybody, and welcome to Best Seller TV. I'm Taryn Winter Brill. We're here with Robert Pizzini. He is the author of Elevate Your Leadership, How to Develop, Maintain, and Advance Lifelong Leadership. Bob, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much. It's great to be here in Dallas with you. Ah, likewise. <laughs> Congratulations on your first book. Oh, thank you. I have to say, it's a great read, and, and it really sticks out. A quote that I loved right off the bat as I was digging into it, you said, you wrote this book with your heart as much as with your head. And I love that. It just kind of warms your soul. Tell us what you mean by that. Sure. So I, throughout my entire professional life, uh, I had experiences like most people do, and some experiences are very positive, and, and you want to repeat those, and some are very negative, and you never want to visit those again. Mm -hmm. And the very positive ones uh, over time become very personal. And you care with your heart. You think with your head, you care with your heart, or you feel with your heart. So I wanted to take those very heartfelt thoughts that I had that were developing over the course of my entire professional life and eventually share those with others. Yeah, and it definitely comes through in the book. You can feel the passion and the heart coming through because sometimes you read books and it's just it's just literature, right? It's just it's just a lot of information, a lot of data, but yours sticks out. And, and speaking of sticking out, another thing I read as I was digging in, um, a very prominent dean of a business school said that there are tons of leadership books out on the market. There are so many. I mean, you Google leadership books, there's a plethora. But she said, this is very specific, you have something new to offer, and it's rare that you hear that. So put that into your own words. What makes yours different? I've read so many leadership books, and I've participated in so many leadership events. You know, a lot of those are academic drills, and uh, leadership is not academic in my experience. It's leadership is action, and it's activity, and it's thought, and it's caring, and it's understanding the human condition. Yeah. And those are all the things that, once again, that I experienced that just had so much meaning for me, and those are the things that I thought were the most important aspects of leadership. And in my leadership journey, yeah. those are the things I think that uh, enabled success um, along the way. Sure. And let's talk about that journey and use the word experience because yours is absolutely unique. Tell everybody a little bit about your background. You you have a military background and that kind of informed the genesis of the book. Oh, there's no question about it. The, the book is founded in my 26 year Navy Special Operations career. So so I grew up watching the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, uh -huh. like uh, many people my age. And I was enamored with all things underwater and, and the realm of the ocean. And I became a scuba diver at a young age. And that led to uh, awareness of Navy diving and what a Navy diver is. And so when I graduated high school, I just wanted to be a Navy diver. Wow. And um, Navy diving led to another career field in, in the Navy called Navy EOD, or Explosive Ordnance Disposal. So cut the red wire, cut the blue wire. Wow. So a career. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it, and that's part of actually the beauty. There could be tremendous pressure. And in that career, you have to learn how to be calm under pressure, sure. meaning you have to think and you have to act and you have to do these things very quickly and very accurately, very precisely. You know, the penalty for mishandling or, or uh, otherwise misdiagnosing an explosive is uh, it's not a good outcome. What is the penalty there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? in your experience? So, yeah. yeah, it's not a good outcome. So, um, so it, that career uh, brought discipline to me. It brought a calm, but it also brought a sense of urgency sure. uh, and a sense of responsibility and a sense of team and all these things that go into that, uh, that type of a career. Um, U.S. Navy Special Operations is just the, the best career field I could think of. We travel the world. I've been to some wonderful places in the world. I've been to some terrible places in the world. Mm -hmm. But the perspective that you get on the human condition uh, is very informative and helps me understand who I am and it helps me communicate and identify with others. Amazing. I just want to reiterate, you said 26 years you spent in the yes. Navy? Wow, yeah. that's incredible. So I'm, I'm always curious, this is your first book. Tell us about the genesis. You know, you've had all these unique life experiences. What makes you say to yourself, self, I want to put this on paper and sort of show the parallel between maybe executive leadership and military leadership, rather? Sure. So, um, so my journey after the military was to go into the private sector mm -hmm. and establish my own business. And in the process of, uh, of creating the business plan of 
finding funding of briefing investors and then building the facility and then operating the facility. When I took on the book, I was operating my business for nine years. Mm -hmm. uh, I just learned so much both in the private sector and then from my military career. And the lessons in leadership overlapped in a lot of cases and they absolutely did not in a lot of cases. Um, and I learned a lot of those lessons, you know, w the hard way as people say. Uh, and, and so I just thought that there was a really good message to share with people on what does overlap and what works well and what doesn't. Um, and, and, and more importantly, uh, I was maturing as a businessman my leadership team, I have 40 people in my company, my leadership team, they've all been with me mm -hmm. since the beginning for uh, 10 years now. Amazing. And so we were maturing as a group or as a team of as a team of people who are absolute professionals, but also people who care about each other, who look out for each other, people who when you put people first, success will follow. If yeah. you don't put people first, um, you're doomed for failure at some point. And there's lesson after lesson and story after story yeah. of these failures. And so putting people first was really, um, really one of the important things. But the other thing that happened in, in writing the book was as a veteran and as somebody who has TBI, traumatic brain injury, mm. I was going through some treatment programs. And in these treatment programs, the aspects of health and wellness that I learned, I, th I felt and I thought that these are things I should have learned in fifth grade. These are things everybody should have learned in right. fifth grade. Are, these are the basic um, scientific principles of, of health and wellness, physical health, mental wellness, uh, and, and the two of those things thrive off of each other. And so as I was learning this, and as I was applying this, uh, and, I was, and I was sharing, as I was sharing this information with my leadership team, I saw those seeds begin to to uh, sprout, you know, and I saw I saw people responding in a very positive way, and I just wanted to share the message. Right, you break leadership up into two parts, Bob. You talk about the art of leadership, and you kind of equate it to an artist's palette, right? There's so many styles of leadership; um, it's not one size fits all, rather. But I want to pick up on what you just said: um, the science of leadership. That's part two, which I thought was so interesting. When you think of about leadership, I think I, I don't know. I don't necessarily think about hydration <laughs> or brain function, even though we probably should be, but you yeah. kind of highlight these really important mechanisms and you say to yourself, well, kind of duh, that does make a lot of sense. So, so tell us about that dichotomy. Sure, so um, again, one of the reasons for writing the book, you know, we hear about the art and science of leadership all the time and there's books written on it and there's books who carry that title yeah. and there's uh, university courses, the mm -hmm. art and science of leadership, but what does it really mean? Yeah. And, um, and it's, for me, it's not all the university level stuff. So the, the art simply is the ability to navigate through all these different mm -hmm. leadership styles and power types and scenarios that are presented to you right. and you have to pick up on whatever style or power type or tool is is at your disposal given that situation just like a, a, a being a navy eod tech whatever that explosive is we have to select the right tools and apply them at the right time right. to get the desired result so that's the art the science uh, for me is a radical shift from anything anybody's ever read about or learned about in terms of the science of leadership because for me the science is this it's the science of leadership is physiological if we're not taking care of this machine on a daily basis in the ways that I very uh, specifically discuss in the book then we're performing, uh, we're underperforming. We might be performing at 50% capacity or 75% capacity or 20% capacity, depending on um, your health and wellness on any given day. Yeah, I love what you just said, leadership is physiological. Um, one of the stats you mentioned in the book, you say that 42% of executives get six hours of sleep or less. Is that right? Yeah, it's wow. amazing. And when I have my seminars and when I keynote and when we have our courses that we do at iFly Virginia Beach, uh, which is where a lot of this originated, and I interact with people, it's amazing um, how executives thrive on less than eight hours of sleep. And, and depending on what book you read, most science agrees that the average adult should get between six and nine hours of sleep every 24 hours right and that's the rest and recharge that um, that is programmed into our physiology and 
if we fight that like Ronald Reagan did and like Margaret Thatcher did, mm -hmm. you know, these are just sleep deprivation is something that can accelerate or lead to Alzheimer's or dementia or some other uh, mental type of disorders. What do you think the biggest mistake is that leaders are making from a physiological standpoint? Is it sleep or is it something else? Uh, well, I think it's, it's everything. It's, it's, yeah. So there's six key components that I talk about in the book. Rest, hydration, nutrition, exercise, brain and heart health, and lifelong learning. And I express those six things as a Venn, meaning they all touch each other. Meaning that if one of them is impacted negatively, for example, if I'm not well hydrated, then my rest won't be as well. My uh, brain and heart communication will not be as efficient. My exercise will not be as efficient. So if one of those six things is negatively impacted, all the others are negatively sure. impacted. Yeah. But the opposite is true. So uh, the more I tend to my rest and my hydration and my nutrition, the more my brain and heart thrive and can communicate. And as a leader, right, because this is about leadership at the end of the day, the better decisions I can make. And just a quick example, yeah. um, leaders who are sleep deprived have a tendency to make poor decisions. Those decisions can be uh, very damaging. These decisions could be immoral, unethical, or illegal. Now, I'm not saying that just because somebody got a bad night's sleep, they came in and right. made a poor decision, but... Tell that to the judge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but these things, um, they all follow each other, either positively or negatively. An exercise coach uh, who I interviewed, uh, he works mainly with executives, and he says that when he asks executives to prioritize their day, Exercise and self-care usually comes in around number five or number six, which right. means they probably never even get to it. Exactly. So if you have to take care of yourself and you have to take care of this machine and the mind-heart connection, um, and the more attention you pay to that, the better you can serve others. Because as a leader, it's your job to serve others. And if you're not taking care of this machine physiologically, you, you are negatively impacting your ability to serve others. It's that simple. Yeah. I wonder, have you seen anyone in real time kind of adopt these new strategies that you talk about in the book, going from you know, getting six hours of sleep a night to then all of a sudden really being able to perform and not make hasty decisions? Sure. So I get feedback all the time, um, and I, I'll give two examples. One is from uh, a gentleman who just left a review on Amazon. It was a wonderful review. He said, uh, you know, Bob, although I've never met you, um, here's how you've positively impacted my life, both at work and at home yeah. because again the better we take care of ourselves uh, the better we can take care of others and that's at home and at work and yeah. it's really that simple so uh, so great uh, great positive impact there in this case um, it was about um, being more in the moment and more conscious for his family you know I feel like I'm there for them uh, when I should be more more than previously. Yeah, wonderful. There was a young woman who bought my book about maybe nine months or so ago, and I watched her go through a transformation, not just in weight loss, she's a business owner. She went through this incredible transformation, yeah. but in energy and mental clarity, mm. and, and her confidence as a leader uh, has grown significantly, and it's just wonderful to see people Love that. grow in that in that capacity. That, that's got to feel great, just because I'm just wondering, of all the executives out there, just to play devil's advocate, who run successful businesses, Bob, who say, we're doing just fine, I'm not exercising, I'm not getting a lot of sleep, I, I don't need to, right? But but what you said, it's really, it's the long-term effect, right? It's it, Short-term, sure, it might be working, but <laughs> down the road. Yeah, that's right. Check back with that executive in five years right. or 10 years, because uh, what we're developing, and it's, you know, the subtitle of the book is lifelong leadership. Right. And the ability to be energetic, uh, to be physically energetic and mentally focused throughout the whole day, yeah. throughout the whole week, throughout the whole month, throughout the whole year, throughout your entire professional life, however long you decide uh, you want that to be, yeah. as opposed to it's two in the afternoon, I can barely keep my eyes open, I know I've got to go to my son's soccer game at six o'clock, how am I going to make that happen? Right. You know, it's this constant feeling of being behind, 
uh, well, if you pay attention to the science of leadership as I describe it, you're on top of it mentally and physically and emotionally, by the yeah. way. I would love to ha see you host a game show where you put executives <laughs> in a boot camp that need improvement and you, and you put them through your military type skills and training. I would love to see how they come out on, on the back end. So just an idea. Yeah, Feel sure. Feel free love to that. take it. You say, Bob, you say leadership is a perishable skill. What do you mean by that? Uh, so that's really quite simple as well. Anything that we don't rehearse regularly, a skill, mm -hmm. we lose. Right. A musician has got to practice, has got to rehearse. An athlete trains and trains and trains. And being a leader is no different. There are skills and tools that we use in leadership. Yeah. And if you don't revisit those skills and keep everything in your conscious mind, so when that situation presents itself, you know what to do, rather than I have no idea what to do, or you do the wrong thing, you overreact or you underreact. Right. Um, if you practice the art of leadership on a regular basis, then you'll be prepared for that situation. If you don't, what you knew a week ago or a month ago is gone, or, or you're too physically tired or your brain is too physically tired to go back in the library and find the solution to that particular situation right. because you haven't paid attention to rest, hydration, nutrition, et cetera. So leadership is a perishable skill. Mm -hmm. Use it or lose it. Yeah. It's that simple. Love it. Use it or lose it. So it's like a muscle that can atrophy. <clears throat> Absolutely that's kind of, that's right. That's kind of how I write it. I want to ask you, because since you say it's a skill, this is something, it's like a plan. It needs to be nourished. Do you believe, Bob, that leaders are born, that people are born leaders. I'm sure people can learn skills to become leaders, but do you truly believe that there are some that are just right out of the gate, this is what I'm meant to do, and kind of everything you teach, they kind of have a natural instinct for? Sure, so I, I think that some people have it in their DNA right. to be more inclined towards leadership. It doesn't mean they're going to be a good leader or mm -hmm. they are a good leader. Uh, and then some people aren't born with that gene, but they develop the skill set over time because at the end of the day, it is a skill set. Yeah. And so you could be born with conditions you, or you could have predispositions to be a good leader. But if you don't exercise that, it doesn't matter. Some people are born with the physicality to be great athletes. Yeah. But if they don't practice, practice, train, 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 they never they never achieve uh, you know, the, the height of, of whatever their sport is. Sure. And, and so leadership is a trained skill. It's learned, it's trained, it's coached, it's mentored, um, and it's repeated time and time again. Yeah. Things that are important are worth revisiting on a regular basis. Right, so I love that, that it's kind of, you think, oh, he's a leader. No, this is something you work at. It's it's something that you really have to, like I say, you know, I always say watering a plant. So really, anybody can be a leader. It's a matter of if you want to put the work in. If That's you, right. If you want that position, if you want that pedestal. Um, when I was looking at the first part, the art of leadership, Bob, and you talk about the personal leadership profile and choosing your particular leadership style, what struck me is, okay, once I pick my style, do styles evolve? Once I pick my style, will that change over time or will I be the same leader forever? So there will be evolution, but there will also be these anchoring points. So okay. you will be the same in many ways. And that, that stability, you being the same, that's very important to people around you. They want to have the same Terran every time they come and see you in the work setting. Right. They don't want to think to themselves, oh, stay away from her today, you know, she's having a bad day, yeah. or hey, today's a good day, today's the day we ask for a raise or whatever. So, so you want to be dependable and stable, uh, so, so there's a sameness there. People get the same Terran yeah. every single day. So there's a foundation of There's leadership. a foundation. Okay. And at the same time, you as a leader should be evolving and changing and growing every single day. You're expanding the tools of leadership right. uh, that are available to you on a daily basis. And, and that's the lifelong aspect of leadership that I talk about. And, and again, the perishability. You know, there's sayings out there, if you're not growing, you're dying. Yeah. Um, and, and I would say that life, generally speaking, is an evolution, regardless of what it is you do. Right. Uh, but if you're in the leadership space, you need to be growing yeah. uh, to be effective and to last as long, as long as you'd like to last. So final thought, Bob, once I have that foundation as I'm growing and maybe changing jobs, but still 
you know, practicing as a leader, can I actually change my style? Because as you see in the book, there's so many to choose from, although that foundation is remaining the same. Sure, so you can change your style and and you should um, as different situations present themselves. Okay. However, you should also know who you are and what it is you're comfortable with. So my three primary styles are coach, visionary, and participative. Participative meaning I wanna hear from everybody. Coach meaning you have the skill, I'm just gonna show you how to use it. Yep. And visionary, which every leader should be, meaning I'm setting the cardinal direction of the organization and I wanna make sure everybody knows it and I'm going to repeat it and uh, discuss it frequently. However, I could evolve in other areas as necessary depending on people around me. People are different. Right. And you have to apply different leadership styles for different people. And I'll, I'll just give you one example. Uh, directive is a leadership style. You go here, do this, you do that. Mm -hmm. Most appropriate in police, fire, EMS, and of course, military, which yeah. has been my experience. But it's not really appropriate in the average everyday workplace setting. Mm. So I don't like to be directive, but I will if I have to. If the situation presents itself, I'll go there. Yeah. Because I know it's there, I know it's available, and I know what it looks like when, it, when the situation requires me to do that. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so you can change and you can evolve, but you also want to have that foundation. There's so much to get to. Um, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but final question, since this is a book about elevating your leadership, just curious, when you were younger, who were the leaders you looked up to? Or perhaps there's one currently. Sure. So, you know, I, I love that question uh, because the seeds of our leadership were planted when we were children, actually. Our parents, our teachers, our coaches, these are the people who were in charge of us. These are the people who led us. And ultimately, we adapt those leadership styles early in life. Uh, we, most of us don't recognize that, yeah. but we just kind of naturally adapt that. So I did have hockey coaches in particular um, that, uh, that I looked up to. And uh, ultimately, early in my military career, there were people who, you know, there's, uh, I can, Billy, <laughs> who hopefully will see this one day, yeah. who's a good friend of mine, but he's, I always wanted to be like him. His leadership was solid. It made sense. He communicated well with people. If he had to be directive, he would be. Yeah. Uh, but I, so that's somebody I always wanted to be like. And even today, there's certainly people out there. So, I, you know, I talk about hockey in the book because I coach high school hockey, and and you know that's a leadership role. But I'm developing young leaders, and so there's a lot of people in the uh, in the profession of hockey, uh, both NHL and kind of more at my local level that I relate to for a variety of reasons. Good men, good women, good people who are trying to really positively inf influence our youth. Yeah, well, I love what you just said, Bob, because it sounds like you're constantly elevating your leadership, which is what we all need to be doing. Um, it's been terrific. The book's excellent. Um, we could talk all day, but I heard a, a, a little sneak peek that there might be another book coming after this? So uh, I, a lot of people, and, and in the reviews, I get asked that all the time, and I do have a draft for, uh, for my next book called Elevate Your Team. Ah. I talk a lot about teamwork and elevate your leadership, so much so that um, Elevate Your Team is a subject unto itself, and uh, so I really look forward to uh, getting to work on that. Can't wait, we hope you'll come back. And if you'd like more information on the book, just check out our website at csweetbookclub.com. That's c-sweetbookclub.com. I'm Taryn Winterbrill. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Bestseller TV. Success transcends cities. As one of the world's most respected business leaders, I know what it takes. Join me now as I sit down with fellow leaders and we share our insights into how you can be successful. My name is Jeffrey Hazlett, and this is All Business. Welcome to the show. From the backyard to the big box, today's guest knows a little about disruption. Jay Steinfeld, bootstrapblinds.com from an idea in his garage to an early e-commerce powerhouse. 
eventually selling the business to Home Depot in 2014. Jay tells the story of his rise in his new book, Lead from the Core, The Four Principles for Profit and Prosperity. Jay, welcome to All Business with Jeffrey Hazlett. Jeffrey, thanks for having me. Well, it's good to have you. You're known as the founder and CEO of Blinds.com, but you built your business story with mufflers and transmissions. Can you explain that? Well, uh, mufflers, but not really even mufflers, franchises. I was the vice president of Meineke Discount Mufflers when there were originally 35 shops built to about 800 or 900. And we were in the franchising business. I, I learned about how to replicate systems at Meineke. And one of those lessons was I was able to take what I built at, even at Blinds.com, a technology platform, and used it to move into other product categories. I, I was a CPA at the time. I, w I uh, went into accounting because I wanted to be into business, but I hated accounting. I never liked accounting. <laughs> I always knew I wanted to be into business. And what, and what taught you in accounting that said, no way, I don't want to do that? Well, you're counting other people's money. I want, I want to make my own money. I don't like to just uh, watch things. I want to participate. I want to be active. I want to build something. And in accounting, you're just watching other people build things. I really wanted to be a participant. So how did you get from Meineke? All right, you're working in the franchise business, and then you come up with Blinds.com. How did you get started, and how big was your first mover advantage in this marketplace? Uh, well, the two questions. I, I got into it because at Meineke, we wanted to, uh, since we were so successful franchising muffler shops, we thought we would franchise other uh, types of businesses, and we looked at the window covering business. The company was sold to GKN, Gaskin and Edifolds, and then they said, no, we don't want to franchise. We sell, we sell uh, mufflers. We want to just stay in the muffler business. So I got fired, and we all got fired, and uh, we decided, you know, that, muff, that muffler was great, but now let's go into the window covering business. So we went into the window covering business uh, after I was fired and it worked out. We had a little mom and pop shop, my wife and I, I was the pop. And then that was 1987 and 1993, we'd heard about something called the information superhighway. And, and the thought, internet. Right? <laughs> That's Yeah, I don't know what that is. I don't know what email is, no broadband, no Amazon, no Google, but uh, went online in 1993, really just as an experiment had no idea what the internet was going to be. I had no idea what I was going to be. It was a, just a marketing experiment to see if I could look progressive to my customers, that I had the latest technology. We didn't sell anything online. And then the next year, 1994, Amazon comes out and we say, you can sell stuff online? Huh, let's sell blinds. And everybody, of course, said to me, that is a ridiculous idea. People can't see it, they can't touch it, they've got to measure it themselves, they've got to install it themselves. And I said, what is the downside risk? So for $3,000, I set up a site to make buying blinds and shades a no-brainer. We called it No-Brainer Blinds, the world's most popular and trusted online source for blinds, because we were the only ones. Selling. Only source, right? The, right, the exactly. only source, so it does makes you the category leader without question. Right, as far as being a market leader, uh, it was good for me because I knew nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. But it was in a way for me to experiment early when there wasn't a lot of money going into the business and certainly a lot of, not a lot of money going into the window covering business because it, the, the addressable market was so small. Nobody thought there was a market. So that gave me an advantage. But um, there were a lot of people who came in after me that surpassed me and I bought them and we grew. And we grew and we actually did become by far the world's most popular and trusted online source for blind. Blinds.com is by far number one in the world. It's still, especially I'm with still, Home Depot. Yeah, well, that was a big that was a big coup right there. Congratulations yeah. to be able Thank to you. see that. First of all, to make a transition is not an easy thing to do, to leave one to to go into the other and even survive the business itself, then to make the transition to online. And then, of course, selling out to a big box store. All of those things don't normally go well for everybody. So you beat the odds all the way across. But I'm still yeah. perplexed. How did you decide 
blinds. I'm, I'm, was that your wife's idea? Was it really your idea? Window coverings? I mean, it's not something I would be sitting around going, mm, yeah, window coverings. That's what we should do. What, I mean, or, what made you decide on that? Well, let me get something very clear. I have no passion for blinds. I know blinds inside and out, but it wasn't like I decided Blinds, I love blinds, I love window coverings, right. I want to beautify the world, I want to provide privacy, security, insulation, all those things. It was because at Meineke, that was just happened to be one of the uh, categories that we looked at for franchising. Mm. And okay. um, we just decided we'll, we'll do it. My wife started it. Um, and then after that, since I was fired and I needed something to do, and I'd always wanted to be in business, I said, I'm a CPA. I'm perfectly suited to sell window coverings. And that's what we did. Now, one of the things you were saying a few minutes ago, Jay, you mentioned that a lot of people say, oh, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. I mean, how many times did you hear that as you went through this progression of starting your own business and then into the dot com and then into the big box before you left? I heard it my whole life. I would say, I'm online selling blinds. And the first thing somebody would do is they'd look at me like, wait a minute, those things right there on, on the window, like blinds. And then as I would grow it, they'd say, wait a minute, do you have employees? Do you have an office? I didn't get any respect. Finally, when I sold the company to uh, Home Depot, they started thinking, well, maybe he actually had a maybe business. Maybe he's got something. Maybe maybe he's going to make this thing. It's gonna... <laughs> Seems like it might have worked out okay. <laughs> That's kind of like the actor that goes to New York and the family doesn't pay any attention, but all of a sudden he wins an Oscar or an Emmy or a Grammy, and then everybody's starting to pay, or, or even a, maybe even a Tony. Let me ask you a question because I thought it was very unique. You also were a pioneer in digital content, in a marketing of sorts, You know, creating your own do-it-yourself videos when YouTube barely existed. Right. How did you come about doing that? What made you think of doing that? First, I, I don't think anything that I ever did was brilliant. It was just logic. If you want to show somebody how to install a blind, create a video. It's so much easier. There was nothing. It was just logic. So what I did is I hired somebody for, I think, $500. We created three 12 second videos of me installing the blind in my bathroom and the videographer was the voiceover and he edited it and we put it online. We said, look, you take it out of the box, put in the brackets, slip it into the bracket. It's a no brainer, no brainer blinds and shades. That was it. That was the whole video. You can see them at jsteinfeld.com. Uh, I still found two of them. They're hilarious. I look at them. I've got hair, so they're pretty old. <laughs> so, and for those who are just listening, he, he might be a, a little hair challenge. So there we go with that. So <laughs> since you grew this company from the ground up, how did you build a winning culture? How did you go about building the team? Well, when I started, I had no idea what culture meant. Core values meant nothing to me. I thought they were just some squishy ideals that you put on a plaque, hang on the wall and never think of again. But the year after I went full-time online, my wife, Naomi, had been married 25 years. She died of breast mm -hmm. cancer. I had to be introspective and think about what makes me tick. And long story short, I came up with some thoughts as to what propels me, what is important to me, existential thoughts that people think of all the time. I felt like I needed to do it. How am I gonna raise my kids? How do I be optimistic ever again? and came up with four. Turned out only one of them was true. But over time, it was important to me to think about it. And the, the things that we believe, the four E's about experimenting, evolving, expressing yourself, and enjoying the ride, all four of those are what I do. I wake up, and that's what I do. And once I realized that, I embedded it into the culture. And everybody there knows that their job is just to get better and to become better than they ever believed possible. The purpose of, of Blinds.com was to help people become better than they ever believed possible. That's what I did, that's what everybody did. And if everybody is getting better, and if everybody is helping everyone else get better, you have excellence that is just happening automatically. It's like autonomous excellence. 
And that made it easy to lead because everybody was improving, not just themselves, but the processes, the, the customer experiences, the, the service providers, all of our stakeholders, our investors, our job was to help everybody get better and, and the community, of course. So that's what we did. It was that culture that allowed us, this tiny little group of people with virtually no money to do things that Home Depot and Amazon could never do. They never did. And that's why ultimately Home Depot bought us. That's, yeah, and I'm sorry to hear about your wife, Naomi. Do you think you would have found those principles, those values, if it hadn't been for that uh, incident in your, in your life? Do you think you would have been as introspective? I mean, sometimes a lot of these times when we have something big occur in our life, maybe it's even our birth of our grandchildren or right. uh, losing a loved one or you know, maybe even losing our jobs. Do you think that's what was a catalyst to help you maybe introspective a little bit? Well, it was certainly the catalyst. The question as to whether I would have ever been uh, enlightened and have been able to do what I did is a question that I'll never be able to answer. Mm. I don't think I would have. If I have to be really honest, I don't think I would have been able to do that. But I was forced into an inherently motivating situation that I needed to. I had to do that. So would I have done it? Would I have read a book and said core values are important? Well, I'd already read that, but I hadn't done anything. I don't think I would have, to be honest. You know, and, and it's, our hero it's a difficult question because now I'm thinking, wow, the, the worst thing that happened to me in my life, my wife dies. Yeah. And that's how I was successful. That's hard to reconcile. It but certainly I, is. You know, we have a we have a lot of people in our hero club uh, and the C-suite network and their their businesses are based on values. And we find that those values drive everything that they do. They have employees who are more engaged. They have customers who are happier. They have, Absolutely. you know, they, they gross more money, they net more money, they have vendors who want to do more business with them. Do you, now that you see those values that you've got right there in the book, lead from the core, do you see those values now being like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't have them before? Uh, or maybe they were there and you knew they were there, but now that you have them, you, it's like night and day? Well, uh, they were there, but I wasn't conscious of them being there. It mm. took introspection and really understanding and looking deeply as to what was there, what was to be revealed. But once it was revealed, once we understood what really mattered, not what we aspired to be, but what we were, the business took off. And we, we said, we can become so much better than we, what, we, what we've been told we can be. And we did. We were able to do things that people said were impossible sell blinds online, build technology that is now integrated into all the Home Depot stores, 2,200 stores that's embedded into an enterprise $140 billion company. That's hard to do. We did amazing. it. Yeah. And that feels really good. Very That's gratifying. amazing. And I, I, having been in a Fortune 50, Fortune 100 company, as an officer of that company, I know exactly what you're talking about and how difficult that is to do and to bring a culture into another culture and win with it. I want to ask you, Jay, you know, since you grew this company from the ground up, how did building a winning culture play into that? We couldn't have done it without that culture. We couldn't have done built technology unless we all believed that we could become better than we were the day before. It was about the evolution every day. Success for us was becoming better every day. That's how we define success. If we could get better, if we could help somebody else get better, if we could improve a process, a system, a customer's life, we were successful. And as a result, we were all every day, multiple times during the day, successful. It wasn't about selling the business or achieving a hundred or even a billion dollars of revenue. And once you had that type of attitude, although there's a lot of accountability because everybody knew they had to get better. It wasn't, we'd like you to get better. It was, you have to get better because how are we going to evolve unless we improve? How are we going to beat Amazon? How are we going to beat Lowe's and Home Depot? We had to become much, much better. And it was that culture, the four E's of evolving, experimenting, expressing ourselves and enjoying it and giving people a voice. 
giving people a true voice where they felt safe to speak up. Because how can you evolve unless you take some chances and you experiment? How can you experiment the right things unless you ask people for input, data? People weren't afraid of disagreeing with me, disagreeing with anybody, because we wanted to get to the truth. We didn't just want to be feel good. We wanted to be good. I love and I love the last E enjoying because you do have to enjoy the ride. Otherwise, why are you doing it? It's got to be a little fun, which I think is important. Let me ask you, as you made the transition into Office Depot, you had one culture, um, not Office Depot, Home Depot. Uh, right. I, I used to deal a lot with Office Depot, so that yeah. always comes to my head when I think about uh, big box companies. But when you had one culture in Blinds.com, and then, of course, Home Depot had their own culture, how did yes. that how did that meld? Did it meld? Did you have to make some changes? What were those changes like? One of the great things that about Home Depot is they knew that one of the reason that we were kicking their butt is because of our culture. And they didn't want to change that. Although, as you know, big companies just can't help themselves to do things that have unintended consequences, especially when it comes to culture. So they told me, Jay, if we do anything that's going to screw up that culture, please speak up. Of course, I expressed myself, no problem. So I had no problem with that. And what we did was we realized, so first we had the foundation that Home Depot wanted us to keep our, our separate culture. But we also realized that we had two different types of culture. We were customer intimate and Home Depot, while they have an intimacy with customers, primarily it was organizational uh, efficiency, operational efficiency. So it was like a love language. Gary Chapman, I don't know if you know his five love languages. Oh, yeah. Well, we basically accepted each other's love language and just said, you know what? You're going to be operationally efficient. We're going to be customer intimate. Let's just not mess around with the other because, look, we're not going to change Home Depot and they didn't change us. We coexisted beautifully. And by the way, we became much better operationally efficient because of the, what we learned at Home Depot. And I think maybe we had a little influence over Home Depot as well. Let me ask you another question. You stayed there for seven years in the leadership team. That's that's almost unheard of as well. Usually yeah. after an acquisition, CEO might st stick around for a year, maybe two, but I don't think I've ever counted on one hand they've stayed around for seven years or even longer than that. Well, there was uh, a good reason for that. Uh, I didn't have to stay. I had no compelling reason, no technical reason to stay. I stayed because I wanted to. I stayed because I was excited about the vision of taking our platform, what we called Autobahn, and extending it to other product categories. That's something we always wanted to do, uh, whether it be custom tables and chairs, irrigation systems, whatever. And with Home Depot, finally, we could do that. So I didn't want to leave until that vision had been achieved. So it took us a while to, to get there, but we did it. And once we were now doing countertops and sheds and um, storm doors and uh, decks, it was, okay, it's time to leave. I've got, my, I've got my successor. I know that the core values are embedded into the company and everybody knows what that is. Oh, and I've written a book just to make sure that whoever is new We'll be able to see what the history was, what the core values are, why they didn't just come willy nilly off of out of some other book that they're true to us so that those core values would continue forever. So it was time to go. I'd been awesome. there 30 the years. I mean, come on. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you about 30 years about that, because in the book, you call yourself a serial entrepreneur, but you were at blinds.com for almost 30 years. Yes. I mean, that doesn't that doesn't make sense. It usually it, is that because you did all these other products is the way you looked no, at that. It, it wasn't about that. It, it, it's because when you evolve daily, you are different each day and your business is different each day. So I felt like I was leading a different business all the time because it got more complex, it got larger, uh, there was more supply chain, Every, everything just got different. So my role was different, my, the requirements, my skills needed to change because the business was changing. So yes, I am not a, just a creative person, 
I like to build something too. And when you build something and it's evolving and it's not stagnant, I looked at it as a new business and that's why I call it a serial entrepreneur. That's awesome. Hey, in less than a minute, because we only got a minute left, I want to ask you this last question because in the book, you say you aren't retired, you're rewired. Right. Can you explain that? Yes. If, if you have those core values of evolving and experimenting and expressing yourself and enjoying the ride, well, you're going to continue to do that. So I started teaching at uh, the Rice Business School, graduate school. I got on five boards to help them. Um, wrote the book. I've got my seven grandchildren, which I call my seven startups. So no, I'm very busy. I am not retired. I am not going to be stagnant. I'm going to keep growing. I'm going to keep evolving. I'm going to see what I can do. I want to see what can I do before I die? What am I capable of? I want to see. Fantastic. Well, Jay, I think we're going to hear a lot from you and I'm glad to see you're rewired and not retired. You need great minds and great entrepreneurs just like you. Of course, folks, we've been talking with Jay Steinfeld who bootstrapped blinds.com from an idea into it in his garage to an e-commerce powerhouse, eventually selling out to Home Depot. Don't forget, he talks all about the story and of his rise in his new book, Lead from the Core, the four principles for profit and prosperity. Don't forget to rush out and get it. Thanks so much for being on All Business with Jeffrey Hazett right here on C-Suite Radio and C-Suite TV. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Hey, at the end of every show, I like to talk a little bit about what I learned from the show. It's about values. Those businesses that have values drive more business, do more business, and have a lot more fun doing it. Don't forget that last E he talked about, enjoying it. And sometimes as business leaders, we forget to enjoy what we reap. And sometimes we have to go through some adversity or even some downturns and some very bad happenings in our lives to find the real purpose for our meaning. And I'm glad Jay found that through the death of his own wife, Naomi, and being able to lead a company, not only to success as a dot-com company, but success in being sold to a much bigger company and staying there for another seven years. A story you don't hear often. And you heard it right here on All Business with Jeffrey Hazel, right here on C-Suite Radio and C-Suite TV.